Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our lightning talk session today. Our topic for the hour is psychology and health. My name is Victoria Hamer McGinn, and I will be moderating this session today. Presenters will be giving a brief overview of their research, and they will have three minutes each. We may have time at the end for questions, so if you have any questions, make sure and put them in the chat and indicate who your question is for. Now, first up is uh, Deborah Kamin, Kamin Mukaz from the University of Vermont. Take it away, Deborah. Thank you so much for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about speed armor and the risk of hypertension in our study, the, regard, the reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke or regards. So hypertension is more prevalent in Black uh, compared to white people in the United States, and Black people have been shown to have higher circulating D-dimer. So causes of essential hypertension, which accounts for the majority of hypertensive cases, are still ill-defined. However, previous studies have shown that inflammation, thrombosis, and abnormalities of the vascular wall uh, play a role in the development of hypertension. D-dimer, a fibrin degradation product, is a key biomarker of uh, thromb uh, tr uh, thromboinflammation. So, we studied whether higher D-dimer is associated with a higher risk of incident hypertension, whether the association differs by race, and whether D-dimer explains racial differences in the risk of incident hypertension. Next slide, please. So uh, the REGARD is a national prospective uh, cohort study of more than 30,000 black and white uh, participants with, uh, who were recruited uh, from 2003 to 2007 uh, and re-examined uh, from 2013 uh, to 2016. The goal of the REGARD is to determine uh, causes of the excess uh, stroke mortality in the southeastern stroke belt of the United States and among uh, black Americans. So within the REGARD, we have the biomarkers as mediators of racial disparities in risk factors or biomediator, which is a sex and race uh, stratified cohort of uh, to classify incident hypertension. And for this study, we excluded participants with baseline hypertension and missing D-dimer, and uh, we calculated uh, the risk of incident hypertension by baseline D-dimer. We also tested for D-dimer by risk interaction, and we also uh, tested whether D-dimer mediated the association between race and hypertension. Next slide, please. So we have three models. We have an adjusted model, which is model zero, then model one adjusted for sociodemographic and uh, uh, adiposity related risk factors, model two adjusted, uh, further adjusted for clinical factors. So for the unadjusted model, what you see here is that the risk of, uh, when you look at the fourth quartile, the risk of hypertension was 47% uh, 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 higher in the fourth quartile compared to the first quartile in the uh, unadjusted model. And then adjustment with the further uh, risk factors, mostly uh, sociodemographic and adiposity related, uh, 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 partly attenuated uh, the risk. But uh, the association of D-dimer and incident hypertension did not differ by race, and D-dimer did not mediate racial differences in the, the risk of incident hypertension. So in conclusion, what we can say is that the risk of uh, thromboinflammatory mechanisms underlying D-dimer variability may play a role in the development of hypertension, and we need more further research. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was excellent. Next up, we will hear from Dove Gold from Brown University. Great, thank you so much. So hi everyone, I'm Dove, and I'll be presenting on our lab's research on inhibitory control and the just right experience in OCD, which is completed under the supervision of Dr. Nicole McLaughlin, one of the COBRA project leaders at Butler Hospital. Uh, so OCD is a psychiatric disorder characterized by intrusive thoughts called obsessions and compulsive behaviors aimed at alleviating the anxiety from obsessions. And impairments with inhibitory control or the ability to resist or stop a behavior are common in OCD. That said, the features of OCD vary widely, and it's unclear if these deficits differ across OCD subtypes. So the goal of our study was to investigate this further. We examined control and OCD patient performance on the stop signal task, which is a computerized task where participants quickly press one of two buttons in response to corresponding arrows on a screen. And at various points during the task, an audible tone is presented immediately after an arrow is shown, which indicates that a participant should not press a button. Uh, next slide, please. 
So these graphs here are showing three comparisons of what's called the SSRT or the stop signal reaction time, which is the time needed to inhibit an already activated motor response on the task. Now this was the only significant variable in our analysis and there were no significant group differences in reaction time without a stop signal uh, or response accuracy throughout the task. So the right hand graph shows comparisons of controls and all OCD patients and consistent with other studies, we found that the SSRT is significantly higher or slower in those with OCD. Uh, regarding comparisons of the OCD subtypes, those of the OCD were grouped two ways. The first grouping involved sorting patients into OCD symptoms based on their most prominent symptom themes. And in that analysis, which is on the bottom left graph, the only significant difference was in the SSRT between those in the hoarding subtype, which is the light blue bar, and the controls, which is the leftmost blue bar. Otherwise, there were no differences um, between the OCD subtypes. In the second analysis, we instead grouped patients based on whether they endorsed the just right experience in OCD. Uh, which is a known entity in this condition. Alongside heart avoidance, uh, the just right experience is thought to be one of the major internal motivators for OCD behaviors and reflects an inner sense of imperfection or incompleteness manifesting in the repetition of a compulsion until there's a subjective sense of perfection or satisfaction. And the upper left graph, you'll see that those with the just right experience have significantly slower SSRTs than both controls and OCD patients without the just right experience. Next slide, please. So we conclude that inhibitory control deficits do not differ among OCD patients when grouped by traditional symptom subtypes, but these deficits do appear uniquely associated with the just right experience in OCD. And these findings also point to a potential overlap in the inhibitory control and just right experience neurocircuitry. So the image on the right is an oversimplified model of the brain's inhibitory circuit, but imagine we have two separate brain signals, a go signal starting in the yellow precephalental motor area and a stop signal coming from the orange inferior frontal gyrus. Both signals are racing to see which can be the first to reach the primary motor cortex in red. And we know from previous research that the just right experience is associated with overactivity in the precephalental motor area or go signal. In that context, our findings suggest that this hyperactivity produces relative deficiencies in the stop signal of the inferior frontal gyrus which may then explain the difficulties disengaging from or inhibiting compulsions until they feel just right. And this may guide neuromodulatory treatment planning as it suggests that optimal neural targets in OCD may differ based on the presence of the just right experience versus other symptom motivators. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joe. That was perfect timing right there. Um, our next speaker is Julia Bauer, who is coming to us from the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. I'll, all you, Julia. Thanks, Victoria. So metals are ubiquitous and commonly co-occur in the environment, and they can be neurotoxic. And this goes for both essential nutrients, such as copper, manganese, selenium, and zinc, as well as non-essential metals like arsenic and lead. And these toxic insults may damage particular brain structures, but can also alter the trajectory of neurodevelopment. And what we see on the right-hand side here is that that might be really important because we know that neurodevelopment is an ongoing process across childhood. So measuring multiple outcome, multiple time points um, of a specific outcome may help us inform how metals are associated with neurodevelopmental trajectories. And it's important to note that there have been observed sex differences between associations of um, metals and neurodevelopment at a particular time point. And researchers have hypothesized that this may be due to interactions between sex hormones and metals, as well as sex differences in the compensation of chemical insult. And really sparse research exists on associations of metals and neurobehavioral trajectories. Next slide, please. So we're asking a question about neuro developmental trajectories, are prenatal metals associated with the change in problem behavior from three to five years of age using extant data from the New Hampshire birth cohort study? And we estimated prenatal metal exposure using infant toenails that were collected two weeks postpartum and measured a suite of metals. And we assessed behavioral problems using the behavior assessment system for children or the BASC-2. And we used three different outcomes, the, the behavioral symptoms index, an overall measure of behavioral problems, externalizing problems such as hyperactivity or inattention, and internalizing problems like um, depression and anxiety. And we calculated our outcome using um, a change measure. So we subtracted the three-year score from the five-year score. Next slide, please. 
And what we found in um, exploratory analyses were that there were sex differences, especially among boys for copper and lead. So if we look at the left-hand side of this graph, we see the association for copper, that copper is associated with reduced behavioral problems across these three indices for all participants that's noted in red, but especially for boys where the estimate in green is showing reduced behavioral problems. And in opposite, um, for lead, it's associated with increased behavioral problems among boys. And so in summary, it's really important that we start looking at how these prenatal metals may be associated with um, different neurobehavioral outcomes across different ages and that sex differences should be considered to protect children's health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. That was very interesting. Our next speaker is Hannah Lowey from Dartmouth College. It's all you, Hannah. Wonderful. Um, I'm excited to present my postdoctoral work in the same cohort that you just heard about, the New Hampshire Birth Cohort Study. And my research focuses on the gut microbiome, which is all of the bacteria, fungi, and viruses that reside in the gastrointestinal tract. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to use microbiome to refer specifically to bacteria. There's been growing interest in the gut microbiome over the last decade because it has been found to relate to conditions such as obesity, diabetes, and even some psychiatric disorders. Some hypothesized mechanisms by which the microbiome may influence the brain and behavior are listed on the right. And in fact, some studies in adults and clinical populations have found associations with conditions such as ADHD, depression, anxiety, and even positive mental health. Because these studies measure the microbiome and behavior simultaneously, it is unclear whether the microbiome influences behavior or vice versa. Next slide, please. My objective was to identify whether differences in the early life gut microbiome relate to neurobehavior in toddlers and whether these associations are different in boys and girls. To do this, I used the New Hampshire Birth Cohort Study, in which we sequenced fecal microbiome samples at ages six weeks, one year, and two years. As you heard in the last talk, caregivers completed a neurobehavioral assessment of their child when they were three years old. And here we are specifically focused on the behavioral assessment system for children of the Basque. Um, specifically, we selected for this study 10 scales that we hypothesized would relate to the microbiome based on the literature. For all of the scales, higher scores indicate worse behavior, except for social skills and the adaptive skills composite. As you can see from the table on the left, boys' behavior was rated worse than girls on almost all scales except anxiety and depression. However, boys and girls had similar microbiomes at all ages um, we examined, shown on the top right with a metric of diversity and the bottom right with a visualization of the community structure. Next slide, please. We found that specific bacteria were related to different behaviors in boys and girls as shown on the left. This was also apparent when examining the relationship between diversity and BASC2 scales as shown on the upper right. Highlighted here, increased diversity at six weeks was associated with better internalizing behaviors among boys, so that's the anxiety and depression, but not girls. Uh, there are many future directions this research can take us. The New Hampshire Birth Cohort Study has ongoing follow-up, and we would like to examine these relationships as children age and these behaviors become more pronounced. In vitro and in vivo models or clinical populations may confirm our findings. Um, New Hampshire is a fairly homogenous state, and to understand the many stressors that contribute to behavioral development, we would benefit from examining more diverse populations. And finally, um, once these findings have been supported by other research, we hope that they can inform interventional studies aimed to reduce adverse neurobehavior in pediatric populations. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was excellent timing. Great work. Um, next up is Kashab Subedi from the University of Delaware. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kashab Subedi, and I will talk on the study that explores the comorbidity profiles of homeless patients and the link between these profiles and the care utilization. Uh, homelessness is a serious public health concern and is associated with increased morbidity. Uh, mortality, acute care utilization, costs, and poor health care outcomes. More than half a million people experience homelessness in the U.S. in a single night in 2020. So there is limited data on clustering pattern of the comorbidities in homeless patients, and understanding of this clustering pattern could be valuable for population health efforts and improved care. 
The objective of this work is to identify distinct comorbidity profiles of homeless patients and to explore correlates of these identified profiles with utilization and demographic characteristics. So the study included more than 3,000 patients who visited Christiana Care Hospitals between January 2015 and 29, December 2019, and were identified using Z59 ICD-10 code and by matching the homeless shelter, shelter address of Delaware. The mean age of the study population was around 44 years, 37% were female and 41% were African-American. The most prevalent comorbidities were depression, drug use disorder, hypertension, and alcohol use. Next, please. Uh, Latin class analysis ELC was used to identify comorbidity profiles, and then we used logistic regression models and time to event analysis approaches for further analysis. Our analysis found four distinct comorbidity classes. Uh, they are presented by four lines in the graph. Uh, along with their conditional probabilities for different comorbidities. Uh, first class is substance use disorder, SUD class, and it has high probability for drug use disorder, alcohol use disorder, uh, but has low prob probability for other medical comorbidities. Uh, this is the largest class and it has the lowest proportion of African American. Uh, second class is relatively healthy class with a low probability for most of the comorbidities. This, is, this class is second largest class and has the highest proportion of African American. Uh, third is medical com uh, medically comorbid with SUD class with, with high probability for most of the substance use related and medical comorbidities. This is the smallest class. And fourth is medically comorbid class with high probability for medical comorbidities, but low probability for drug and alcohol related comorbidities. Uh, next, please. So when, when we looked at the relationship between these profiles and their uh, healthcare utilization in terms of their readmission, uh, the hazard for hospital readmission was significantly different among these classes, even after adjusting for other risk factors like age and their different characteristics. So compared to the patients in relatively healthy class, the hazard for readmission was 3.1 3 times higher for patients in medically comorbid with SUD class. Uh, 2.1 times higher for patients in medical comorbid class and 1.96 times higher for patients in substance use disorder class. Uh, in conclusion, these clustering patterns and this cluster could guide healthcare and homeless, homelessness intervention to minis, minimize healthcare uh, utilization burden in homeless patients and also to devise the tailored intervention for homelessness. And with that, I would like to acknowledge Delaware CTR and thank my colleagues in Christiana Care and University of Delaware who helped with data and data analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Kashab. Our next speaker will be Sam Hornstein from Brown University and Butler Hospital. Thank you, Victoria. So today I'm excited to speak with you about gauging public perspectives on neurosurgery for OCD. Clinically, OCD is defined by obsessions, intrusive thoughts or urges, which may or may not be combined with compulsions, actions a patient feels driven to perform. There are many treatments for OCD, though 10 to 25% of these patients are treatment resistant. For those with severe, debilitating, chronic OCD, neurosurgery may be considered. While surgeries have proven safe and efficacious, little is known about their perception in the community. The internet now plays a massive role in how people obtain medical information and recent analyses of online forums have given insight into psychiatric disorders. So in this study, we posed the question, what is the perception of OCD neurosurgery on online forums? Next slide, please. Our methodology began with database searches, which uncovered 173 relevant posts. Using applied thematic analysis, we systematically classified post content. Lastly, two independent raters analyzed these posts in Invivo software. So in terms of results, I'll share two with you today. Firstly, we analyzed the impressions that posters had about surgery. As shown in the table, negative impressions were twice as common as positive ones. However, as shown in the figure below, impressions of surgery varied considerably by posters' experience with OCD. Here, the x-axis shows the number of posters, and the y-axis represents negative, neutral, and positive impressions of surgery, respectively. The colors represent categories of self-identified experience with OCD. As indicated by the green in the top bar, among 32 posters with negative impressions of surgery, only one had personal OCD experience. 
Contrarily, on the bottom of the graph, among 16 posters who had positive surgical impressions, six had personal experience with OCD. Next slide, please. So in an age of rampant misinformation, we also analyzed how misinformation shapes perspectives of OCD surgery. 31% of posts contained misinformation, while only 25% contained evidence-based information. Additionally, as shown in the figure, rates of misinformation varied significantly by posters impression of surgery. Here, the x-axis groups posters by impressions of surgery, and the y-axis represents the percentage of misinformation shown in black or evidence-based information uh, shown in gray among these groups. On the left, we see that 70% of posters with negative impressions of surgery cited misinformation, significantly higher than in neutral and positive groups. So in terms of discussion, this study is part of a broader effort to analyze the barriers to and facilitators for OCD surgery. One promising future application involves employing neural network algorithms to detect misinformation on forums and then having them moderated by clinicians. This study has important clinical implications in that providers can better understand the perspectives that make their way into the clinic. This work demonstrates that it is essential not only to invest in the discovery of medical treatments, but to ensure that the public has access to reliable information about these developments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Our next presentation, we're going to hear from Meg Gonsalves from Brown University. Hello. Anxiety disorders are the most prevalent psychiatric illnesses in the United States, affecting approximately one in five individuals annually and engendering severe social, occupational, and physical impairment. People with anxiety are typically treated using a combination of medication and therapy. However, symptom improvement is in inadequate in over one third of patients. Thus, many individuals are forced to find relief through cutting edge alternative therapies. Today, I would like to introduce you to a non-invasive peripheral nerve stimulator developed specifically for the treatment of anxiety disorders. It is called Mechanical Effective Touch Therapy, or MAP. The prototype of this wearable device resembles a commercially available MP3 player, but delivers gentle vibratory mechanical stimulation to small areas of skin behind each ear. For treatment, patients are instructed to self-administer 20-minute sessions of MAT at home at least twice daily for four weeks. In a small open-label pilot, preliminary data has demonstrated that MAT is associated with significant improvements in clinical anxiety symptoms. However, I would like to take this opportunity to discuss MAT's potential mechanism of action through cortical function. Such findings will help to inform how MAT is associated with one, modulation of functional networks, and two, how changes in such networks influence clinical outcomes related to anxiety. Next slide, please. In order to do this, we examine the effects of open label MAT on clinical symptoms in resting state functional connectivity in 22 adults with Axis one anxiety disorders. After collecting resting state data at three time points, baseline, immediately after one dose of 20 minute stimulation, and after completion of treatment, we found the following. First, strong positive, stronger positive resting state functional connectivity between various limbic regions and the default mode network or a set of regions activated during wakeful rest is predictive of greater anxiety symptom improvement at mat treatment endpoint next slide please Secondly, when looking at acute effects immediately after one MAT session, we observed increases in insula connectivity to pain and motor regions. Finally, chronically, we found that, um, that increases in positive functional connectivity between the cingulate cortex and anterior supramarginal gyrus were significantly correlated with decreases in comorbid depression scores. Being the first study of its kind, we have shown that a small portable device worn for only 40 minutes a day is associated with changes in resting state um, brain connectivity, and that such chronic and acute changes relate to symptom improvement. This study ultimately demonstrates the future potential of neuroscience-based mental health treatments and also underscores the importance of understanding mechanisms of action underlying psychiatric therapies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meg. That was very exciting. Um, our next speaker is going to be Aaron McHugh from Southern Maine Community College. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you, Victoria. Early life adversity, such as malnutrition, abuse, and economic disparity, is an issue commonly seen in adolescents today, an age range already facing increased risk for stress-related health disorders. These adverse experiences can impact the neurological development of the child, resulting in mental illness later in life, with females being at a higher risk. 
While humans convey emotions via verbal and facial cues, rap emit ultrasonic vocalizations, or USBs, to communicate threat and contentment. And our lab has shown that these aversive USBs produced when a rat is anxious or fearful can induce an anxiety-like state in a listening rat. Thus, by using 22 kilohertz USB playback, the frequency of set alarm calls, we're able to create a translational method for evaluating effects. However, while our lab has shown that aversive USB playback evokes anxiety-like behavior in typical males, it is unknown whether early life adversity for sex impacts USB-induced behavior. Therefore, using a maternal separation paradigm to induce early life adversity, or ELA, male and female adolescent rats undergo behavioral assays while listening to 22 kilohertz USB playback. And neural data is evaluated in brain regions commonly associated with anxiety to determine cell recruitment in each area. This slide shows our timeline for testing. And as you can see, we begin our caregiver deprivation model when a pup is two days old. At this point, they are separated from their mother and litter mates for a period each day until weaning at P21 or postnatal day 21. On P35 and 36, adolescent rats are tested on different assays to gather behavioral data and tissue is collected for later analysis. Next slide, please. We use both the elevated zero and open field test. Oh, next slide, please. We use both the elevated zero maze and open field test as a means to analyze exploratory behavior, but I will focus on the open field test. For the open field, hypervigilance and anxiety-like behaviors are analyzed using time spent in the signal tactic or outer area of the arena. And this behavior leads us to believe the rats are experiencing anxiety-like symptoms as the ELA rats tend to be less exploratory. Next slide. Our preliminary data supports this belief and we see a decrease in the time spent in the center during both silence and playback time bins. However, we are currently limited by the number of rats in each condition. At the moment, most conditions have an N of two and data from male ENA, ELA rats is forthcoming. CFOS staining will also be used as an index of cell activity in the basal lateral amygdala and bed nucleus of stride terminalis. With an evidence surge in diagnosed psychological disorders, identification and remediation efforts are crucial areas needing to be addressed. My study provides timely insight on the effects of ELA on anxiety outcomes in both sexes over development, and by analyzing during adolescence, identification of risk via behavioral changes could lead to identifying and improving individualized therapeutic interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Our next speaker will be William Samson from the University of New England. All you, William. Hi, everybody. Um, that title is a little bit long, but I'm talking to you all about antipsychotic drugs and trying to use zebrafish embryos as a model for studying their side effects. So lots of people take uh, atypical antipsychotic drugs sometimes called second generation antipsychotics, uh, but they come with a lot of nasty side effects, um, increased ri risk of fracture, certain metabolic disorders, and the concern of this project was immune dysfunction. So uh, some antipsychotic meds are associated with an increased risk of infection, have been shown to dysregulate pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines um, in humans. So what we really want to know is if these drugs are impacting inflammation, how? And um, you know what? My slideshow was actually updated since this, so I've been looking at something else for a while. Just go to the next slide. I'll explain it all. Don't worry. All right. So do zebrafish embryos actually take up these drugs when you give it to them in the water? Uh, that's what we need to know to know this is a good model. So we did a dose ranging experiment where we gave a bunch of zebrafish embryos, uh, risperidone and olanzapine, which are antipsychotic meds, administered at different drug concentrations in their water. And then we used liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, and to measure the drug concentration in the whole embryo. And uh, we were able to use that information to choose a dose of each of these drugs that was representative or similar to what you would expect in human blood plasma. So uh, that was the big finding was that we could continue to use these uh, zebrafish embryos as a useful model. 
Um, but as far as inflammation goes, inflammation is regulated by these things called prostaglandins, which are hormones. And here is a sort of simplified version of that. Um, and we want to know if these drugs are impacting the pathway. You can go to the next slide. Please. Okay. So um, we tried to measure prostaglandin concentration in whole embryos. Um, and it didn't really work with liquid chromatography. So now what we're doing is mixing a bunch of embryos together into one little pot and seeing if that will uh, give us a reading. But we did carry through with the methodology and we dosed the embryos with drugs or control and then gave them an inflammatory challenge. Um, and we're wondering, and we haven't measured it yet, we're still working on it, but we're wondering if maybe the production of prostaglandins is getting knocked down uh, when you give them these drugs. So I know it's three minutes, but you know, if you're interested, uh, stay tuned and we're gonna keep doing this into the, the rest of the year. So thank you. Thank you, Will. That was great improvisation. High five <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, we are actually doing well on time in general. So I will reiterate that if you want to ask a question, you can do so by um, writing it into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And please make sure to indicate who the question is for because we have lots of speakers. All right, our next speaker is Sydney Bonato from um, Bowden College. So take it away, Sydney. Hello. As we heard from my colleague, Erin, adversity and stress experienced in childhood and adolescence have potential to physiologically impact the brain and may lead to the development of mood disorders. We call this early life adversity or ELA and our lab models early life adversity with a rat model and with maternal separation for a few hours every day until rat pups are weaned and pair housed at 21 days old. This summer, we have been collecting preliminary data through behavior tests for anxiety, possibly caused by maternal separation and influenced by ultrasonic vocalization playback. We run behavioral assays with different cohorts of rats on different postnatal days to also consider the effects of maternal separation across development. We're also looking at differences between males and females who we expect may develop at different rates and be affected by early life adversity to different extents in different brain regions. And eventually we will be testing both an appetitive positive stimulus USV at 55 kilohertz frequency and an aversive stimulus at 22 kilohertz frequency. Next slide, please. Overall, we're working to develop and characterize a translational model comparable to the human fearful face task by varying different frequencies of playback that rats hear during our behavioral testing. Since rats do not communicate through facial expressions like humans, they instead communicate comparable social information through these ultrasonic vocalizations. By playing back recorded rat calls at these two frequencies with two distinct social meanings and running behavioral tests, we can analyze how ELA affects behavioral responses to social stimuli. For our behavioral tests, we're using both the elevated zero maze and the open field test with the idea that the more time a rat spends in the closed arms of the elevated zero maze and the more time it spends in the thigmotaxic zone shown in red in the open field, the more anxious they are. Next slide, please. We've gathered preliminary data for our open field testing and are seeing some interesting trends within some experimental groups. Most notably, you can see on these charts that all female ELA rats in both ages P35 and P45 increased time in the thigmotaxic zone during their second five minutes in the open field, regardless of if 22 kilohertz playback had started or not. Control animals were clearly affected by playback in different ways in both ages, indicating that the aversive stimulus elicits different behavioral coping strategies for control animals but not ELA animals who seem to exist at a constant state of anxiety. Um, in addition to our behavioral data, we'll also be identifying the types of cells that are active in three brain regions in response to USVs to try to determine the underlying neural mechanisms of ELA as probed by USV playback. Um, looking at sex differences and considering changes across development will allow us to make further hypotheses about how humans are changed by ELA and how we can potentially intervene and mitigate the negative effects of experiencing early life adversity. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Sydney. That was excellent. Now we're going to hear from Christine Shrimp from Brown University and Butler Hospital. Christine? Hello. Um, major depressive disorder is a debilitating and common mood disorder with one in 10 people suffering from it each year. The burden of depression is exacerbated by the lack of adequate treatments. 30% of patients don't get better from medications alone. For these patients, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, is a non-invasive treatment option in which pulses are sent through the brain to relieve symptoms. The mechanism of TMS is still unknown, as is the underlying pathology of depression. A leading hypothesis is that depression is the result of brain network dysfunction, and TMS may work to reverse depression-related changes. EEG, or electroencephalography, is a method of measuring brain activity through scalp electrodes that detect current on the surface of the brain. Our group asked, what can EEG tell us about neural network dysfunction during depression, and how can we use EEG biomarkers to guide treatment? Next slide, please. EEG microstates are successive short time periods in which the scalp potential remains semi-stable, and these microstates reflect dynamic activity of large neural networks. In this analysis, the number of microstates are chosen to explain the majority of the variance in signal. Once microstates are defined, they are backfit onto the recordings and microstate labels are assigned in a winner-take-all approach. At the Butler TMS clinic, patients receive TMS treatment for six weeks. We have EEG recordings from a sample of patients before and after their treatment course, as well as clinical depression scores that indicated their degree of recovery. Using our patient data, we found defined six microstates and found two microstates that had significant changes associated with depression recovery. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And microstate two includes the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and right insula, which are regions associated with the positive effective reward circuit. As depressed patients got better, this microstate occurred more frequently, indicating greater activity of this reward circuit. On the other hand, microstate 3 includes dorsal, ventral, frontal, and parietal cortical regions active with depression-related inhibitory networks of attention and cognition. Microstate 3 showed less activation in accordance with antidepressant response, indicating a reduction in the activation of this depression-related network. Overall, this work showed a novel modulation of neural dynamics associated with depression recovery. However, there are still several questions to be addressed. First, we don't know if these changes in microstates are unique to TMS therapy or if they're a signature of a general antidepressant response. Second, this finding could open the door for predictive biomarkers that could allow clinicians to determine which patients are likely to benefit from treatments like TMS. These biomarkers could even suggest shifts in treatment parameters to optimize treatment efficacy for patients in a promising move towards personalized medicine for depression. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. That was very interesting. Um, our next speaker is going to be Katie Yetter from Brown University. Katie, it's all you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Yetter, and I am a senior at Brown University. Today, I will be presenting on transcranial direct current stimulation and mindfulness, combating psychopathology after trauma. This topic is especially important to me as a Marine Corps veteran, as I have seen the dangerous effects trauma has on others. It is also extremely relevant in the current times. First responders have continuously risked their lives during the COVID crisis, which puts them at risk for developing psychopathology as well. The motivation for this research comes from the significant research gaps in PTSD prevention approaches. Prevention approaches rely on adapting interventions intended to treat patients, which only helps individuals who are already experiencing prodromal symptoms. The ability to flexibly regulate our feelings and emotions is suggested to be the key to resilience. Flexibility is the process of when we can determine what is happening to us, what we should do about it, if we can do anything, and if we should continue doing it in the first place. Certain regulatory behaviors may be appropriate for one context, but can be maladaptive in the other, which is demonstrated in individuals with PTSD. With that in mind, we hypothesis that this flexible regulation is supported by strong functional connections between the amygdala, a brain region critical for threat responding, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, a brain region important for top-down regulation of amygdala-generated threat responses. Next slide, please. 
In order to test this hypothesis, we use a two-edged approach using TDCS and mindfulness. Here, we synergistically apply non-invasive transcranial direct current stimulation that may increase medial prefrontal cortex activity to improve regulatory control. TDCS modulates intrinsic neuronal activity by changing the neuronal resting potential, thus altering the likelihood that neurons will or will not depolarize. Mindfulness uses a process of enhanced self-regulation mechanisms, including attention control, emotion regulation, and self-awareness. Practicing mindfulness causes an increased activity in the attention association areas, which focuses on goal-oriented behaviors and actions. VMPFC activity increases with TDCS, while at the same time, mindfulness decreases activity in the amygdala. We hope that this two-edged approach will improve the flexible use of emotion regulation and thus reduce the development of psychopathology after trauma, therefore allowing servicemen and women to defend their country and first responders to treat public health crises without having long-lasting detrimental consequences on their mental health. These American heroes deserve to get a break from the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good work. And also, I love that you're adding um, a personal sort of human component to it. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is actually our last speaker, um, Seneca Ellis from Bowden College. All you, Seneca. Hi. So my project is looking at the sex-specific effects of acute ketamine treatment on parvalbumin and BDNF following early life adversity. Ketamine is a dissociative drug commonly used as an anesthetic that is more recently being considered as a, as a treatment option for depression and anxiety. The goal of the study is to identify some of the underlying me molecular mechanisms that drive ketamine's antidepressant and anti-anxiety-like effects. If you look at the timeline here, we get pregnant rats and house them until they give birth. We then use a maternal separation model of early life adversity in which we separate the rats from their moms for four hours a day from postnatal day two to postnatal day 20. We then inject ketamine when they're young adults at 55 days old and proceed with behavioral testing for the days that follow. Next slide, please. We are using three behavioral assays. So the first is the sucrose preference test, which is the test for depression. The rats are given a choice between two water bottles, one with sucrose water and one with regular water. The idea is that unlike a control rat, a depressed rat will not show a preference for the sucrose water. Then we do the open field test, which is a test for anxiety in which the rat's exploratory behavior is being assessed. A more anxious rat will spend more time around the edges of the open field, while a less anxious rat will spend more time in the center of the field. And finally, we have the elevated zero maze, which is also a test for anxiety in which anxious rats tend to spend more time in the closed section of the raised platform than the control rats. Next slide, please. And finally, onto the molecular mechanisms we're looking at, we're interested in two specific proteins, parvalbumin and BDNF. Parvalbumin is a calcium binding protein frequently found in interneurons. It causes the cells it's found in to fire action potentials at a much faster rate than other neurons, allowing parvalbumin positive cells to synchronize the activity of the surrounding neurons, making it very important for the inhibitory excitatory balance in, neuron in neural circuits. BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is very important for synaptic plasticity, among other things. We are using immunohistochemistry to look specifically at the hippocampus, basolateral amygdala, bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, and the prefrontal cortex, all of which are considered important in the development of anxiety and depression. Early life adversity has been found to decrease the levels of both parvalbumin and BDNF, meaning that these proteins may be implicated in the development of these psychiatric disorders. We are therefore seeing if a single dose of ketamine can reverse these effects, both on a behavioral and a molecular level. Finally, I mentioned that we're looking at whether these effects are sex-specific. This is important because in the past, anxiety and depression models in rats have almost exclusively looked at males. This is obviously problematic, but becomes even more problematic when studying drug treatment options. Males and females may respond differently to drugs, and it is vital that we know how these differences function in order to create a truly translational treatment option. This will help us push the medical field and the field of research to consider a diverse array of patients and move us one step closer to individualized medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Seneca. That was perfect timing. Like she finished right on the clock. Excellent. Um, so thank you all of you for your presentations. It's evident that you have been very busy um, in this last year doing excellent work. 
it's also very evident that you are well prepared. Um, and I must say that having been to many poster presentations in the past, I almost prefer this format. Um, all of you have done an excellent job of putting together your elevator pitch um, and sort of, you know, really putting that that data into a very understandable format. So silver lining of us being virtual all the time, I suppose. Um, all right, so let's start with some questions since we have a couple of minutes. Uh, the first question is for Sam. Sam, are you there? Um, and it says, it is interesting that all physician posts were categorized as neutral. Is there qualitative research among clinicians that supports this neutral view? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, there's actually been prior research um, on different specialties of clinicians. Uh, for instance, according to one survey, 74% of psychiatrists indicated that they would refer a patient for neurosurgery, but only 25% of neurologists actually felt the same way. Um, and there's also been a study with OCD patients uh, versus OCD clinicians and sort of how the perspectives vary. And while 90% of clinicians had positive impressions, um, only 50% of OCD patients were positive about surgery. And we think this is really important because these discrepancies may actually reflect the lasting psychosocial ramifications of early neurosurgeries, um, which included the now infamous lobotomy. Thank you, Sam. The next question is for Seneca. There, Seneca. Uh, the question is, have you tested the most effective age to start treatment? Um, that is to say, in this mouse model, you started treatment at day 55, but could starting at postnatal day 45 or 65 have different effects? Yeah, that's actually a very good question, and hopefully we will be able to start investigating that this upcoming year, because it's very likely that there is uh, an age effect, uh, especially because uh, P45 is more of an adolescent age for rats, and typically we don't want to give ketamine to younger individuals, and we certainly don't do that in humans, but it's possible that um, that it will affect the the parvalbumin and bdnf cells differently and so that's definitely something that we are interested in and will hopefully keep looking at more work to do that's excellent <laughs> always exciting uh, the next question is for christine and for megan and the question is for t for oh for tms and matt it sounded like there aren't identified mechanisms for how the therapies improve symptoms could the two presenters talk about the hypotheses for how this external simulation helps patients? So I can speak to TMS. So TMS is usually done over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which um, a lot of studies have shown is not as active in people with depression. So the idea is that by stimulating that and inducing um, depolarization there, you can lead to long-term potentiation of that area that leads to longer-term activation there. Um, there are still studies done about the exact mechanisms of this, but it's likely acting on um, glutamate and NMDA receptors and other things that are known to affect long-term potentiation and neuronal plasticity. Awesome, Christine. Yeah, um, that's great. I also study TMS in addition to Matt, and that was spot on. Um, so with Matt, because this is a completely novel device, there really hasn't been any research done on it. So we are the ones kind of pioneering the way. But with functional connectivity, we are hypothesizing that, you know, there's going to be alterations between and within certain networks, such as the default mode network and the central executive network, where there's hypo and hyperactivity that will be readjusted um, to be less overactive or underactive. Um, with that, um, it's also hypothesized with Matt that because we are stimulating or via vibration certain afferents behind the ears, such as the um, A beta and um, CT afferents that connect to obviously the somatosensory cortex and other limbic structures, such as the insula, we believe that by causing this pleasant, effective touch, that this will also um, modulate these networks. So that's what I can say for Matt. 
Thanks, Meg. And the next question is actually also for you. Um, this is, um, somebody says, extremely interesting research with lots of exclamation marks. Um, can you speak to the affordability of this device? So I guess things like, you know, health insurance and stuff like that. Yeah, so because this is a prototype device, um, I'm not exactly sure how much it would cost, but right now it's really meant to be affordable for all people. Um, so that way, you know, you can wear it when you're driving, well, not necessarily driving, but, you know, doing things that wouldn't necessarily stop your day to day routine. And because it's a simple plastic device that just goes on behind your ears, I'm assuming the idea would be that you would go to a clinic, be able to get this from your doctor, it would most likely be covered by health insurance, and, or if not, something that you could maybe even buy on Amazon for no more than like $100. Um, I don't think it would be that expensive, um, but I'd be happy to talk more about these ideas um, after the talk. Thank you, Meg. Yeah, there's so many cutting edge technologies that have been talked about in this session. So it is really exciting, especially in these times of COVID where there are, you know, mental illness, um, you know, is, is something that, that we, that is very important to us at the moment. Um, so there are no more questions. So thank you to all the speakers for adhering to your time limits um, and for your wonderful presentations and stay tuned for the next session if you're watching.